We are live. Welcome to Iron Marvel Netflix Iron Fist show review. So, I am going to start by telling you that this was a show that I really loved, as long as we're talking about season two, and really hated whenever we're talking about, okay, let's say the first, the first half of the first season. And this video will have some jokes, and I will definitely get into some serious subject. So, let's see, I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it through time. This video is a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler, so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in the MCU franchise, not ones released later but set earlier, only ones released earlier, even if some are Let's see, um, yeah, yeah, so as a quick example, technically the Black Widow solo movie takes place, you know, let's see, I guess during or before the show premiered, but it was released later, so I'm not going to be talking about, I'm not going to spoil anything from it, and that brings us right i have watched every episode once each and let's see yeah so i um, yeah plot i'm just gonna quote imdb a young man is bestowed with incredible martial arts skills and a mystical force known as the iron fist especially once you get past the first half of season one now yeah so uh let's see you don't really need to know much about, like, there are, there are some references to, you know, the Avengers and such, but by and large, you don't, you don't really need to know very much MCU stuff in order to follow this show. Do note that the Defenders miniseries takes place and was released between episodes one and two, and as such... Season 2, did I say episode? I meant seasons. First you have Iron Fist Season 1, then you have The Defenders, which only had one season, then you have Iron Fist Season 2. So, if you don't watch The Defenders, there will be stuff in the, f the second season where you are not going to have any clue what they're talking about. So, it's... Yeah, I would, I would recommend it. And besides, you know, it's only... The Defenders is only eight episodes. It's better than Iron Fist season one. It is the the um, ah, what's the word? Yeah. So these are no longer on Netflix. I'm told I don't have Netflix. Probably never will. Yes, I know. There's some amazing stuff on that is only on Netflix. It is now on Disney Plus, which is the only streaming service I currently have, and I'm not sure that's ever going to change. So yeah. If you have Disney Plus, you have access to both. You know, it's not going to cost you extra. It's just time that you, you know, if you do watch The Defenders, it's only time you're spending, not money. So, I would definitely say that season two is bingeable. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say the same for for season one. Um, let's say that. I would definitely not recommend, or, you know what, if you're enjoying it, you know, go nuts, but go for broke. If you are not loving the first half of season one of this show, don't force yourself to binge it. Give your, you know, I watched one episode per day, and that was fine. You know, I could get through that, but if I sat down and tried to binge... The first half of season one, yeah, I would, <clears throat> I might not have made it all the way through the show. So, let's get into the writing. So, let's see, right, yeah, the, the show was created by Scott Buck, and some people say that he did a really bad job on Dexter. I mean, I would say most of Dexter was good. Um, yeah. 
I'm not making any excuses for Inhumans. For that one, I have not watched any of yet. I, you know, in the future, I intend to. Yes, I know. Pray for me. It's, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're religious. If you're not religious, uh, I, I don't know. I guess um, close your eyes and think really hard. I think that has the same effect as, as praying, which is none. And... Yeah, um, he definitely didn't do the best job on, right, and actually, I, huh, right, that was the link that I just figured I'm not going to need anytime soon, so I went ahead and removed it from my favorites. What's that saying about, like, it's, garbage is the thing you throw out right before you realize what you need it for, something like that. And here we are. So yes, um, that's right. Scott Buck was showrunner for the first season, and then M. Raven Metzner was for season two, which might help explain why it's so much better. So the... Yeah. Um, I've already... Mentioned this a couple of times, even though we're not very far into the video. Anyway, the f the first half of the first season is bad, I would say. The The second half of the first season is basically average. Like, it's fine. The second is much, much better. Basically, second season fixes every issue it can without retconning, recasting, or rebooting. So yeah, the the first season actually starts out without making completely clear if Danny, you know, if if the person if if the character played by Finn Jones is in fact the Danny Rand and if he does legitimately wield the Iron Fist or if he's lying or maybe delusional, but by the first by the time the first season of this premiered, Marvel Netflix was sufficiently established that it was completely clear that they were not going to center the first story about the Iron Fist on someone who is not the Iron Fist. Like, as a, just briefly, I'll I'll mention. So, yes, before the. Yeah, March 17th, 2017 was when the first season of Iron Fist premiered. By that time, there had been two seasons of Daredevil, one season of Jessica Jones, one season of Luke Cage. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, right. The Punisher had not yet, you know, and Defenders, as mentioned, had not premiered yet. But yeah, this was the fourth show and the fifth season of Marvel Netflix and all the other ones are about the actual characters so I it's it's a baffling decision to me that they decided to open it with you know I'm, I mean I'm not sure that we the audience are supposed to think that he's delusional but other characters do and it obviously does cause some problems for you know Danny that yeah, nobody believes that he is who he says he is. But yeah, it's a it's a look. If the first season of Iron Fist was the first piece of Marvel Netflix premiering, then Marvel Netflix would have died right there, and that would be a shame. But yeah, um, season one, the characters are inconsistently written, changing from scene to scene, and occasionally even within the same scene, without any proper justification. If there was proper justification, that would be fine. There are, you know, there is such a thing as life-altering events, but that's not really what we're seeing here. They're just suddenly, yeah. I I gotta give props to the actors. They try. They try to sell it. You know, they they are done. No, no favors by the script in season one. Season one starts tremendously slowly, and the first half of it is frankly boring, like a four out of ten, and after that it becomes somewhat better, like a six out of ten. So, plot twists, yeah. Um, 
season one definitely has some very bad handling of, of plot twists. Like, there were times where I was not entirely sure if something was even supposed to be a plot twist because it was just so unbelievably obvious. Like, I would, I would sit and wonder, like, they can't actually be, because we, we already know, okay, um, season two does much better at, at plot twists. There are some very, very interesting ones, and they are not, uh, like, there's not, they're not difficult to, to follow. They, they, you know, they'll, they'll follow established rules or tweak established rules. So yeah, the pilot is terrible and makes you want to not continue watching. I, I really, look, I get it. They had 13 episodes to fill. They didn't have 13 episodes worth of material. Kind of a thing with the Marvel Netflix shows. Um, yeah. The, the... Even with that, I maintain they could have had a much more interesting first half. And the pilot definitely did not need to be anywhere near as bad as it is. The finale is excellent. And I can't really give a lot of details without spoiling. I have not read the comics. Um, I am aware that this does draw on at least some of the more recent issues and some, you know, I've read reviews by people who did, who, who are very familiar with the comics, and certainly some things they did a, a good job of adapting. And that brings us to the direction. I will admit I don't know that much about East Asian culture, but then neither do the people responsible for the first season, so... Now, uh, yeah, so if you have a show where the first season is very focused, it can be really effective if the second season, or at least one of the follow-up seasons, really goes on toys with what is set up in the first season. Maybe characters that have a lot of power lose that power, or vice versa. A major character loses something that used to define them, has to come up with a new identity. So a short list of shows that do this, and not all of them are in season two. Prison Break, Dexter, Alias, various Star Trek shows, Burn Notice, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and this. So, uh, yes, I have some critic quotes. And, yeah, um, this is season one. I will let you know when I get into the direction for season two. So, critics. Too little action, bad action, the choreography is meh, and you can tell that the actor playing Danny only learned it ten minutes before filming fights. I don't even know, how do you even do that, like... Anyway, uh, unlike the equally arrogant Tony Stark, Bruce Wayne, or Stephen Strange, Danny has no redeeming features. The audience is given no reason to like this unfunny hero we're just expected to because he's the titular character. Uh, it's too similar to Batman Begins, and it doesn't do the things that Batman Begins does to... You know, it worked in Batman Begins. Doesn't work here because some really important things are missing. The premise of the story is fascinating, but the execution is the disaster of a white savior wielding a mythical Asian superpower representing an Asian cult and having an Asian fetish living in a world where somehow most villains are Asians. The amount of cliches and confused portrayals of Asian culture is also astonishing. Its target audience is the manga-reading white supremacist who thinks his katana from eBay will help him score an Asian girlfriend. Once you get past the cringeworthy racial issues, be prepared to... Be caught up in the confusion of ever-shifting characters. Every 20 minutes or so, the runtime has each character roll the dice and take on different personality or moral stance. Love or hate, alliance or betrayal, calm or anger, friend or mortal enemy are all interchangeable here, making it difficult to root for any part of the show. Is Kunlun heaven or hell? Is Van Enterprise doing good or evil? Is Danny an enlightened savior or just a rich, spoiled brat? Iron Fist is a work that makes you appreciate films that have... Consistently flat characters. Wow. And let's see. Yeah, so 
Another critic points out that one of the big problems is a sense of place. Well, two places, actually. You'd think that a show with the main character who has arrived in New York City from a monastery in the high mountains of Tibet would avail itself to exotic locales. No. It's an office building, a small dojo, a secret compound that looks more like a dorm quad at Vassar, and every vacant lot in New York. Even when they do go somewhere... Uh, um, don't think I'm going to give away where. Let's see... Yeah, it, it looks like, I think it might be yes, but yeah, it, it it doesn't look like the real thing. And one entire episode takes place inside a warehouse. Wow. Here's an idea. How about a flashback to the monastery that doesn't take place in a small clay-walled room? Only once do they create something imaginative. Let's see. And yeah, I don't think I want to give... Oh, wait, what exactly is that? I'm telling you, if I didn't know any better, I'd say this had the location budget of a Hallmark film. I get the, the budget... Right. Uh, that was the critic. Now, back to me. I get that the budget maybe didn't allow for live action or 3D CG of the kinds of things that in the comic is really just a matter of can the artists draw them on time, the writers write them. What we do get is too little too late and... Honestly, I believe I can speak for many when I say that we would have been very happy with at least 2D animation. Honestly, even just comic panels. You could be cheeky with it. Have it have that be the opening, and then we see Danny was reading it to himself, chuckles, then the pilot goes on from there. You know, like someone happened to think of something that you know, yeah, someone heard the legend and turned it into a comic book. And now Danny is like, oh, wow, that's exactly what I experienced. So we see what it is supposed to be instead of just, yeah, they, they wait entirely too long. And, and again, you know, it would be fine if Danny was likable. You know, you can have a vague, like, there's a, there's a lot of movies and TV shows and such where you don't know what happened right away. And... You're grabbed because there's something very interesting or the characters, you know. So, yeah, just briefly, uh, Prison Break, Dexter, Lost. Um, yeah, honestly, I'd say the, the, the other, you know, Marvel Netflix shows. So, once again, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Defenders, and Punisher all have something early in their pilot episodes that really gets you interested in seeing where it's going and this one just does not and right another critic quote season one is the first marvel netflix show to lack a clear identity and yeah you know season two so much better it has a very clear like Season 2 basically hits the ground running, like, from right away. There's stuff going on. We want to fi find out what is, you know, where is this going. And, you know, it gets a lot out of using previously established characters, which, obviously, the pilot... I mean, I guess if it borrowed from one of the other Marvel Netflix shows, but I'm not criticizing the pilot for not using established characters. I'm praising the season two opener for doing it. Because, I, I mean, I think basically someone working on it was like, people don't like the new characters we're establishing. So we gotta, we gotta try to salvage the ones we already have the best we can and just make sure that stuff is already happening when the season two opener starts. So... Finn Jones plays Danny Rand slash the Iron Fist, a billionaire Buddhist monk and martial artist proficient in Kung Fu with the ability to call upon the mystical power of the Iron Fist. And, right, Jones describes the character as someone struggling to find his identity and he identifies with the character's loneliness because he too is an orphan. And let's see. He noted that Danny gets really stressed and pissed off sometimes, and I understand that. His optimism and where that comes from. And in preparation for the role, Jones studied Kung Fu, Wushu, Tai Chi, along with weight training, Buddhist philosophy, and meditation. 
and Toby Nichols portrays a young Danny Rand. And yeah, you know, in season one, some of the time they do get decent fish out of water comedy out of the fact that he, you know, so basically he, sp yeah, it's said very early in the pilot, he spent 15 years in this, it's, you know, t temple studying the, the, yeah. So, you know, he comes back to New York and there are a number of things that he has forgotten about living in a um, modern city in America. And yeah, you know, one of his enemies is the hand. And, you know, it's like, it's already difficult to fight, like, you know, people who are good at fighting. But the hand can resurrect people. Now, the way they do this is they infiltrate your chromosomes, no clone, their DNA has got a strain of its own, and it's toxic. And, yeah, um, critic quote. For those who haven't seen Iron Fist, this is entirely about season one. Danny Rand is Steven Seagal light, constantly spouting martial arts psalms and never once uttering anything close to a joke. He emanates an almost dangerous lack of self-awareness. Sure, it's weird that we're supposed to buy the character of special karate white man in 2017, but the pill would go down a lot easier if there was some hint of lightheartedness to him, something that allowed audiences to laugh at him a bit, as well as get behind his journey. Instead, Danny doesn't just become a rich, white, rich, powerful white guy, but the lamest kind of rich, powerful white guy. Danny is meant to be a savior or something as he rallies, rallies against unkicked heads and big business alike, but his quest as the chosen one never feels like anything more than your college roommate's two-week uh, quest to try Tai Chi each morning, especially when he's paired with Colleen Wing, the owner of a martial arts dojo with actual experience. He shows up in New York shoeless with an I traveled abroad this summer and it changed my life outfit and immediately re remarks, about how he used to skateboard in a skyscraper. You're so effing cool, Danny. And, yeah, some people have said, you know, he does a reasonable job, he's talented, but miscast. Now, uh, I wanted to... Yeah, you know, it's, it's this... Like, he really has no idea how... You know, he kind of, he, he sometimes tries to get people to like, I'm, I'm still talking about season one. He sometimes tries to get people to like him, but he seems to have no concept of how to do that. And like, he will do just, and, and occasionally other characters will even call him out and say, you can't do this. This is not okay for you to do, you know, and just, he doesn't seem to get it. Like, very like Elon Musk energy, just, and I realize there's, there's people who, idolize Elon Musk, which, I mean, no, that's just sad. I, I tried, I really have tried to think of, of something to say about that with, but no, it's, that's just sad. And I am not going to detail the many, many things that mean that Elon Musk is not someone who deserves even the tiniest smidgen of our respect. No. Thought Slime, the f fellow YouTuber Thought Slime, has done a very great job of of that. I guess I'll put... Yeah, I'll, I'll just... I'll include link... A, a link to the... Yeah. To his various... To, to Thought Slime's various videos on... Elon Musk. Now, I want to try to tackle the whitewashing issue. I realized that when the comic was conceived, a white savior narrative was common. I realized that making the lead a white guy from New York may have been the only way for the character to become popular. If he actually was Asian, it might not have gone that way. And I do think some good has come of the character having become popular. Some people appear to reject the idea that they should change the character be, to be Asian out of hand, to which I say... Look at all the hate crimes towards Asians that came in the wake of COVID-19. It is very clear that the average American needs to empathize more with Asian people. And so those who say that an important part of the character is that when he comes back from Kunlun, goes to New York, he's a fish out of water because he has forgotten how people behave in America. I think the solution is to make him a second generation Asian immigrant to New York. 
you know, in Kunlun, he learns his original culture. When he returns to New York, he has to try to balance his original old world culture with how people expect him to behave in New York. Not only would it solve the whitewashing issue, but I find it would be a much more interesting conflict. And if you don't care about the whitewashing, Season 1 Danny is boring, bland, unlikable, and irritating. Now, Season 2, he has grown from his experiences in The Defenders. He is a much less annoying person and just, yeah, um, he has a self-awareness. He is trying, he, he appreciates that he has things that other people will never have and just, yeah, um, just so much better. And his, frankly, his, the, the fighting choreography is, is much better. And it really, like, based on both Defenders and Season 2 of Iron Fist, I would definitely say that Finn Jones himself is not the problem with the, the fights in Season 1. I think if, they, if he had been taught the choreography more than 10 minutes before, which, as far as I understand, is what they did on Defenders and Season 2 of this, it would have been much much better i have i have very little criticism of the of the fighting in season two now jessica henwick plays colleen wing and yeah she you know martial artist runs her own dojo chikara dojo in new york city henwick felt the world the word that defined wing most was alone saying she doesn't want to be anyone's love interest and open herself up in that way in her portrayal Henwick also tried to pull out that sort of very dry humor that Wing has and that no bullshit New Yorker demeanor from the comics version of the character. She's great. She's one of the most in engaging and entertaining characters. And because that's the case, at the very start of season one, she is also made to be annoying, which is just, I, yeah. Are we 100% certain that Scott Buck wasn't trying to get fired when he did season one? I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just me. He just... it, Especially the first half of season one. Now, uh, let's see. I think that is everything I have to say about her character. Now, yes. So, Tom Pelfrey plays Ward Meacham, the son of Harold Meacham, childhood acquaintance of Rand. His work building up Rand Enterprises with his sister Joy is threatened by Rand's return. Although Ward is a character from the comics, Pelfrey noted, we're not necessarily beholden to representing him in the series exactly as he appears in the comic book. Strub said that Ward would experience some male angst on... Uh, yeah, Jessica Strub, who plays Joy Meacham. Yeah, Ward would experience some male angst on Rand's return because Ward would have been the one who picked on Rand when he was little, so as pure and innocent and great as Iron Fist is, he comes in and he causes some problems there. And I think that... Okay, Il Ilan Eskenazi. Oh, that is an unfortunate last four letters of his name. Portrays a teenage Ward Meacham. Sorry, Ilan. School must may not have been the most fun experience. Jessica Stroop plays Joy Meacham, the daughter of Harold Meacham, a childhood acquaintance of Rand. Her work building up Rand Enterprises with her brother Ward is threatened by Rand's return. Stroop said that Joy absolutely loves Rand and his return to New York is like this rebirth of what she once was and she gets to ask these questions about herself because she's he's posing them to her. Stroop said that Joy would initially be unsure whether Rand is who he says he is and Amy Lawrence portrays a young Meacham, Joy Meacham. Now, both of those characters are just unbearable in the first, and you know, part of it is that a lot of the time we're seeing them interact with each other and or Danny. So that is not helping matters in the slightest. Both of them get a lot better. Uh, ultimately, let's see, I guess it's the, the last chunk, the, the second half of 
season one. They get much, much better. And Ramon Rodriguez plays Bakudo, a mysterious... <sighs> yeah, I think I'm just going to keep it vague and just say, you know, he is he is great. I really, really enjoyed the the character and the act, and, and from right away, but I'm not 100% certain he's in the first half of season one. So anyway, Sacha Dewan plays Davos, a skilled martial artist who, uh, let's see, I don't know how much I want to get into, hmm, yeah, so... Yeah, he is he is important. And some people say that he doesn't have enough charisma and like he's not quite interesting enough. I mean, maybe it was also just because I was 100% ready for the character when like once he yeah, we we it it was it was a boost to the show in my opinion. And Rosario Dawson as Claire Temple would not be a Marvel Netflix show if Rosario Dawson wasn't at all. So, so yeah, former nurse from Hell's Kitchen. And, yeah, um, she's great. You know, Rosario Dawson, she's incredibly talented. And, yeah. And I don't know if I want to give away who David Wenham plays uh i'm really quickly gonna see when is it that um hmm. is he in the show from very early on or is let's see hmm this is not where it's I, th I think I will just say you know he is he's having fun and it's fun watching him have fun and just like I David Wenham has been in multiple different things this is not the uh, yeah I th I'm not sure I've seen... Yeah, yeah, uh, I suppose... Oh, that's right, he is an Elvis. Yeah, I uh, actually... Possibly also... And I, anyway. So, yes, I have seen him in the Lord of the Rings trilogy and Van Helsing and 300 and the recent Elvis biography and... Oh... He's in Public Enemies? I didn't remember that. Anyway, yeah, um, I, I'm not entirely sure. Oh, he's also in the... He lends his voice to the Van Helsing video game. I think that's um, completely insufficient to, to atone for his performance. In that movie but then again like nobody gives a good performance in that movie including really really talented actors and and i do think he is talented overall but yeah you know hugh jackman delivers a really bad performance in that movie as well and have you seen logan so yeah um moulin rouge wow yeah he's in stuff i don't remember him being in anyway I don't know if it was how he was directed. I don't know if there was something in the script that gave him this idea. I can understand, based on some of the things in the first season of the show, why... Basically, in some of these movies... So once again, he is in Lord of the Rings, 300, and Van Helsing. These are movies where he has to give fairly large performances... You know, in, in 300, he's actually the narrator, in addition to appearing in the film. So, you know, his character is the narrator. Maybe he thought, oh, that's what they want me for. Um, yeah, I'm not 100% certain if he always does the larger-than-life operatic thing, but 
he did in in those things he does in this show and yeah it's just like you're either gonna be like smiling ear to ear at his performance or you're gonna be like i can't believe they're actually doing this and i don't really want to give away Alice Eve portrays a character in this, and yeah, uh, yeah, it says it, it's fine here, a mysterious woman. That is all I'm going to give you. I'm just going to tell you she really, like, I, I am aware of Alice Eve. Uh, I, she, there's not very much that I've seen. Yeah, yeah, she's in Men in Black 3. Uh, oh, that might actually be, th th that and this might literally be the only things that I've actually seen her in. Uh, let's see them. Yeah, that, though, yeah. I, I'm not entirely sure how like she is perceived but i know that there is a certain chunk of the internet who aren't willing to look past her appearance and i'm not going to be talking about her appearance but i think that you know first of all she was not cast for her appearance she was cast for her talent in this show and she really like she might have done it uh, other places as well like like i said i really don't know <sighs> yeah i'm i'm up oh, she was in bombshell like is there a single bad actress and so so yeah she shared you know the movie with charlize theron nicole kidman and marco robbie so just yeah um i guess someone googled you know incredible actress so yeah Jay Roach directed that? Austin Powers and... Okay. Alice Eve was cast in this because they knew that she could, you know... And, and again, I, I don't know if it's based on earlier work or a really great audition or what exactly, but they really... She, she is... Yeah. Um, deeply compelling in, in this. And, yeah, so, the, the, yeah, the, you know, as far as diversity goes, yeah, I already mentioned there are a number of Asians on the show. Yeah, there's, you know, other than Asians, it's pretty white people heavy, although... I suppose there is a decent, are there maybe roughly as many men as, as many women as men? So, you know, yeah, that's, that's a thing. And, you know, to be fair, the, the African American experience is very, very well covered in the Luke Cage Marvel Netflix show. So, Yeah. It, um, yeah. And, let's see. So the, yeah, the dialogue is also not particularly good in season one. Um, yeah, sometimes it's, like, very, very, like, they basically just, you know, it, it feels like, Someone was, was like, working hard on the script, and they got to a spot, and they're like, okay, um, we have to get character A to tell character B, you know, this, this basic, you know, they have to convey this basic concept. And they wrote a couple of words describing the basic concept, and they just couldn't figure out a natural way, so instead they just 
made the line of dialogue, the brief description of the concept. It's just, it's, yeah, gets much, much better in season two. And that brings us to the cinematography. Now, the, the yeah, in the first season, there's definitely some interesting stuff. Um, I th uh, is that a spoiler? Um, yeah, there's there's definitely some, and and the camera work will very effectively capture scope sometimes. Like the the pilot basically starts with Danny. I'm just gonna double check. Yeah, I already muted, so I. I'm almost certain, but I'm just gonna really quickly double check. And. Yeah. The pilot starts with Danny just walking. Yeah. You know, walking in New York and the camera captures, you know, the giant skyscrapers and the, yeah. And there's some really excellent cinematography in the second season where just, yeah, um, some of the action scenes are incredibly well shot, the, the, the angles and, and such. And the editing is good there you know like the other marvel netflix shows you know some of the time it will you know the editing will toy with time and place employing nolan's smooth editing between past and present also seen in the excellent movie martha marcy may marlene and the special effects um considering the budget for these Marvel Netflix shows, the special effects are basically about what you would maybe expect. I just wish that they did a better job, like, hiding the... the there's some very obvious green screen shots. And... Yeah, the the... Yeah, some of the really mystical stuff. Some some of the stuff that they couldn't, you know, couldn't do with practical effects. Yeah, they they would do the the they would use CG. Now, yeah, so the stunt work also, you know, season one, eh, season two, excellent. And you can really tell that at least some of the people really, really know what they're doing with the with the fighting. And yeah, this was actually shot in New York City on location. And so the right, um, the right, the the score is you know it really fits the show quite nicely. And. The sound design is average in season one, but there's definitely some really good stuff in, in season two. And, you know, the Iron Fist itself, as much as it sounds like a sex toy, it is a formidable force, which I suppose does not change. That still kind of makes it sound like a sex toy. It is it is powerful. Uh, it's... it's um, Moving on. Anyway, it, it obviously needs... It, you know, you need to work sound design because nobody... You can't just, like, call up the real person with the Iron Fist and ask them, hey, could you help record some Foley? No, they actually have to design how, how it sounds when this thing hits something, which frequently means that it breaks the thing it hits, which... So, so yeah, you know, and because because at the end of the day, if we don't, if the sound doesn't sell it, we don't believe it. And yeah, they they do a really good job, which is really good because at the end of the day, like, 
I think on the on the page, it probably it, it they they can make it look really good, you know, d using drawing techniques. But at the end of the day, when you're when you have it in live action, like the way that, you know, because they try to do this very, uh, what's the word? Like a like a clear. Ah, let me think. The the um, they try to have a very gritty, down to down to earth street level hero feel to the Marvel Netflix shows. So what we get is a glowing fist. You know his his fist glows. That's that's the immediate visual of it, and that by itself is not very impressive. Before you start seeing. You know, it, yeah, when you see him use it on someone, and especially the noise produced when the, yeah, that's the, the kind of thing. And, yeah, so pacing, um, the first season is the apparently written in stone 13 episode length that almost all of these Marvel Netflix shows, you know, the, the only exceptions are the eight episodes of The Defenders and the ten episodes of season two of this, which is part of why season two is so much better. A very, very you know, one of, one of many, many parts. But, yeah, um, the, the, um, The first several episodes, not very much will happen. I guess I could briefly... Let's see. I th uh, is it... Yeah, I think it is about episode... Is it episode four or five? Um, yeah, I would, I would recommend if you can't, you know, don't, if the, if the pilot just completely puts you off, I don't blame you, but if you can, you know, to take your time, but if you can get to and through episode four, by the end of episode four, I would say, the the show has yeah if 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 you watch through episode 4 and nothing at all in episode 4 makes you want to keep going yeah go ahead and just stop watching i would definitely say that was around where it turned for me so uh let's see yeah that, i think that was the one where i started like anyway the Uh, yeah, so, let's see, the, the, that brings us to the, the best element, in my opinion, of this show. I suppose it's probably the character pairings in season two. And the worst aspect is the, just how underwhelming the first couple of episodes of season one are. Now, uh, yeah, so looking at other reviews, one of the biggest criticisms is, you know, Danny Rand being whiny and otherwise annoying. Uh... Yeah, so most worried about was probably that the the uh, yeah watching a rich white guy explain an East Asian person's own culture to them, and unfortunately, the first season has some of that. And it was hard to, to get through. So the thing I was most looking forward to was 
another corner of the Marvel world. And yeah, so I already mentioned that the season one opener is bad. The season one, the season one finale is fine. The season two opener is really, really great. Uh, right, and the overall season is average. The season two opener is great. The season two finale is excellent. And the, you know, the overall season for season two is really, really good. G great, even. So, the season trailers do give at least a little too much away, but also give you a good idea of what the show is like. Cover and poster do not give too much away. Uh, let's see... That brings us to the Rotten Tomatoes. So yeah, the season one, it has 20%. With the consensus being, despite some promising moments, Iron Fist is weighed down by an absence of momentum and originality. So 20%, that is... Yeah, um, 85 reviews, only 17 fresh. And the average rating is 4.20 out of 10. Now, the audience score is 71%, with the average rating be 3.8 out of 5, and 11,381 ratings. So, for those who might not be super aware of how Rotten Tomatoes works, 71% voted, you know, rated it at least 3.5. And, you know, yeah, at least that, maybe more. So, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people just wanted to see Iron Fist. And, and there's, you know, that's fine. I'm not saying you're wrong for, there's, you know, there's stuff I like that is not necessarily, like, or there's stuff I enjoy, even though I... Yeah, that sounds like you're in denial. It's fine to enjoy something, even if it's not great. I do take issue with the people who make a big deal out of, well, the character was white in the comics, so it would be more wrong to turn the... You know, to make him an Asian character in the show than to just let it be. You know, this what the the character yeah. The first appearance of the character is in nineteen seventy-four. You know, at that time it was completely understandable to to do that kind of thing. But yeah. Uh let's see. Um And, and, you know, I've heard that the the comics, like, some people really, really love the comics. And I can totally understand that. Um, I, yeah, I think, you know, East Asian culture, there's some really compelling stuff there. You know, I, I try not to fetishize it, but, yeah, you know. Um, right, right. Uh, I have watched almost everything... Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Um, so, I know that one of the movies he made is... There we go. So, the movies of Hayao Miyazaki. I have watched... I think it's two-thirds of them. Uh, subs, not dubs. I love Akira. I think it is masterful. And I completely understand... Why the Wachowskis apparently also love that movie. Uh, and I love the manga. The manga really blew my mind. I I would have, you know, I get why the movie can't fit the entire manga in. It would have to be much longer. I would be fine with that. But I get that there's, you know, you have certain limitations. and You know, but no, the movie is really, really great. Um, and I, I love when they, like... It's the kind of movie that make you, like, let's see, I'm, I'm just going to double check so I don't, so I'm not talking out my ass here, but I, uh, let's see, ah, uh, 
Yeah, and it's no wonder, you know, the film is widely credited with breaking anime into mainstream Western audiences. And, yeah, it's really no wonder. They, it's absolutely incredible. And, let's see. Um, right, yes. Um, the, the director of the movie, Katsuhiro Otomo, actually created the manga itself and it it just makes you wonder why isn't this the rule why is this the exact exception because he does such an he completely understands his own material which sounds like the most obvious thing in the world but yeah you know you can you can really tell like i i had a very very high expectation for the movie after loving the anime so the manga I swear I know the difference between anime and manga. And, yeah, um, I, I really, really felt like the movie actually delivered, like, a lot of what I had hoped. So, yeah. Um, you know, so, so I get being super into East Asian culture. Now, yeah, so that was season one. Season two has right it is still rotten but it has a 55 percent better action scenes tighter pacing elevate iron fist's second season but it remains a lesser light among mcu shows so yeah the average rating is 5.7 5.70 5 out of 10 47 reviews and 26 of them fresh and you know below 60 something is still rotten but the audience score is now only 62 percent based on 1942 ratings so yeah there's a there's a that's that's what you call a precipitous drop so less than a fifth of the amount of people who yeah that is, yeah. Um, and on Metacritic, it has a 30... Oh, hold on. Yeah, yeah, 37 out of 100 based on 27 critics. And I'm going to look. Let's see. So... There we go. So... Yeah, 27 critics, 14 mixed, 13 negative, 0 positive. So, yeah. And on... Oh, actually, yeah, I want to see how many of the... Okay, so for the... Yeah. Um... Oh, hold on. Yeah, okay. Two of the negative ones are season two reviews. And let's see. Of the mixed ones, two, three, four, four of them are mixed. So, okay. So, so yeah. More negative reviews of season one than of season two. That makes a lot of sense to me. And yeah. So, the, the user rating on Metacritic is 5.8 out of 10 based on 109 ratings, 51 po positive, 27 mixed, and 31 negative. And unfortunately, this one does not, it, it you can't separate by, yeah, a bunch of these did not write the, the, Uh, yeah, a, a bunch of these don't write, and I can't tell by the year either because they were, yeah, they, they were written after season two came out, so I can't say how much any of them watched, and yeah. And that brings us to IMDB. Now... Yeah, so 
it has an average of 6.4 out of 10 based on 131,891 IMDb users. 22.3 gave it 7. 18.9 gave it 6. 14.5 gave it 8. 11.3 gave it 10. 10.9 gave it 5. 7.1 gave it 9. 5.7 gave it 4. 3.9 gave it 1. 3.4 gave it 3. 2.1 gave it 2. I gotta say, I can understand, right? Like, again, I really, I wish I could ha have it separate it out. I I can understand giving the first several episodes of season one a, a one out of ten, uh, honestly. But, yeah. And on the, yeah, so there are 1,082 user reviews on IMDb, and if I say hide spoilers, there's 846. There are 88 links in the IMDb external reviews section, and I could read 43 of them, so they were in English and not dead links. And I think that pretty much covers... So this, yeah, this has some some violence at times getting fairly strong, and I'm not sure. I I wouldn't really say that it's like, um, it it when it gets very strong, it didn't feel to me like it was just, you know, they they felt like it would attract attention. Um, like, sometimes the really graphic violence is letting us know, okay, these are people who do really awful things to people, to other people. And, uh, right, so, sexuality, um, yeah, I, I would say there there are times in this where it feels like, at the very least, the way that the sex is presented, it feels like it's trying to to attract viewers by you know, the the they're hoping that that young men will tell their friends you got to watch the show. There's sex in it. Other times there it is definitely telling us the relationship that the characters have. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it's quite as... Um, like, you know, I haven't watched season three of Jessica Jones yet, but the first two seasons of Jessica Jones really understand that sex can be an expression of two people's, two people's relationship with each other and how they the way they feel at that time. That's also something in the first season of Punisher. I haven't watched season two yet. You know, so, yeah. But but here, some of the time, it is that. And, yeah. Uh, this does not have any special features on Disney+, Plus, but both seasons are there. You don't have to go around looking to a bunch of different streaming services. Yeah, so I think I... Mm. Wait, did I... Huh. Okay, I will try to fix that. Wait, did I put it... Hmm. Well, I shouldn't take long at all to deal with... So, there we go. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, I already mentioned that season one, like the first chunk is a four out of ten, then it's a six out of ten. And yeah, I would say season two is probably an eight out of ten. Uh, I, what is that, what is that average out to? Whatever, I don't care, I don't major in math. Now, uh, I will, 
yeah. Um, so, ranking all of the Marvel Netflix seasons that I have watched, worst to best, and I love all except the first season of Iron Fist. So, Iron Fist Season 1, Daredevil Season 2, The Defenders, Punisher Season 1, Iron Fist Season 2, Luke Cage Season 2, Luke Cage Season 1, Daredevil Season 1, Jessica Jones Season 2, and Jessica Jones Season 1. So, hit me up in the comments, let me know, you know, are there much, much better, you know, or, yeah. What is your favorite martial arts driven story? And, you know, yeah, what's your favorite Bruce Lee movie? And that brings us to... Yes, so, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it's working for the hand. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler-filled thoughts on the most recent episode of Willow. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video instead of in a separate video, since its running time is significantly shorter than the show. You know, yeah, if you just want to hear... I meant to say that earlier in the video. If you just want to hear my spoiler-written thoughts on the two seasons, I have made videos, and the link to both of those videos will be in the description box. So, yeah, in other, more, in other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.